In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In life, Lady Ramamuza cherishes the gospel of Christ. May Christ now give her the sweet words of eternal life. Come, blessed of my Father. I invite to. In life, Dindi Wamabusa prayed the mystery of Christ through the rosary. May Christ now welcome her to the throne of grace. gathered today to celebrate the life of a beautiful soul mother to us. Let us recommend the soul to Christ and therefore let us acknowledge our sins so that we may be able to prepare to celebrate this sacred mystery. I confess to Almighty God to you my brothers and sisters that are ready to see because I do my way to what I've done and what I've failed to do. We take a seat to listen to the first reading.
Let me start again. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord.
we listen to the second meeting read by the meeting with the The second reading is a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps 
and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lambs, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lambs. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, they may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him at, to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. In his theology of aesthetics, von Balthasar reflects on beauty and goodness. He writes, In Christ, beauty and goodness indeed coincide and come to expression in and through each other. The more we see beauty, we become aware of how good the Lord has been. This morning, we reflect on this truth, the beauty revealed to us. In the creation stories, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 to be precise, we hear over and over that God created all things and he saw that it was all good. In Lindiwe Mabuza, God, God's brilliance, shone perfectly. She was a true servant 
and celebrant of beauty, and therefore a producer of goodness. Ma loved beautiful things and lived her life in full color. She was forever present in God's beautiful garden, the earth. And I'm led to recall that at one point I was going somewhere, as she was always going somewhere with her, and I was late. She had called 12 times before I could get to her. But when I got there, for some strange reason, she wasn't ready. And she walked out gracefully and slowly. And I was confused. I thought we were very late. She stood outside the car. It was an evening. And stared at the sky. At this point, I just thought, let's just not go to this thing. And she said, a beautiful night, the stars and the moon are in full glory. You see, even in darkness of the night, she was not phased by darkness. For she knew that even then, the shimmers of light, the light of hope, reign above. Or how one day I thought was the most random of all, after a long conversation, she went on to tell me about the story of the two birds outside her window. I thought we had reached the height of madness. She was telling me, the poor chap, I think it's the husband, he has been building for days this nest. And his partner didn't like it. She cheeky, in a cheeky way, tore it down. She went on to say, you see, even birds have standards. There was nothing in her, nothing in her being that didn't desire excellence. All she embarked upon with great bravery would be done meticulously with precision and class. We had another problem. She didn't sleep. And she would get, uh, we curse the person who introduced her to WhatsApp. You would get these messages and messages, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Her emails and notes were legendary, lengthy and detailed, beautiful that they themselves should be published. Her love for this continent, especially this country, the best she has ever known, having traveled the whole globe, as she said, emanated from her reception of its beauty, the charming hills, its streams, its animals and fields, its people, and so much more. It is no doubt that she responded with producing the highest form of goodness, and that is service. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says not all of us can be famous, but all of us can be great because greatness is determined by service. Was it not Christ who said, the greatest among you must be a servant? One of her greatest teachings, and a lot has been spoken about her love for the arts, diplomacy, and so much more was that she loved children. Her face always lit up when a child appeared. The renowned portrait painter Richard Stone recounts that when Lindy Mabuza first visited his home, they had rehearsed and rehearsed with his little son how to greet an ambassador. 
And yet when the little boy walked in, her face lit up and the little fellow could only do one thing but give her a hug. We had many problems. The second problem, which is not really a problem, a good thing, she was immensely generous. Or should I say problematically generous? She couldn't stop. She couldn't help herself because she was quick with solutions and acts of kindness. One quickly learned that you do not tell her all your problems because she loved solutions and she would be part of the solution. She was always making something right, fixing and beautifying. And dare I say, even some of our own homes. She was a dazzling wordsmith and could communicate. She could also communicate silently. Well, that I can tell you, you would prefer her words than her silence. She was commuted to beauty and goodness, that she knew truthfulness. She abhorred the opposite of truthfulness and honesty and integrity and saw the social evils that seemed to be visiting our people. She abhorred this growing number of thugs in suits masquerading themselves as self-acclaimed leaders of our people. They were the greatest traitors Traitors to our revolution, she would say. Her life was so inter interconnected with others. She was a mother. And here I direct myself to my darling sister, Tembi, whom I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank today. You, my sister, are the daughter every parent deserves. Your care for your mother, who was fiercely independent, was an act of what I call a great domestic diplomacy. We have seen you walk gently and silently behind her, lest she tired, and you would be there lest she cast her foot against a stone. You would be there. For this, and for the person that you are, you enjoy our love and our great respect. She herself, now I address myself to Mtutu, often said, you are like her in so many ways, especially in your bravery. Of Sfiso, I can only say, let's just say all of us present here combined, wouldn't even come close, even come close to share the place that Sifiso had in her heart. She was a great friend. And all this, life reveals a tapestry of life, a view of the face of God. We turn now to this most beautiful gift. We return it to God for it is indeed beautiful. On her 80th birthday, which I couldn't celebrate with her, one of her many 80th birthdays, I penned a poem called August Meteor. And perhaps that is what I would love to say to her last. August Meteor. Upon the dense village darkness, in carefree night tide, when the sun's gaiety dies, when the moon rains, as the day's sweat finally dries and silence hovers on rural skies, a meteor dares the king of the night, launching across in full sight spreading outward for all to see that beauty 
cannot be contained. That dusty and dull August on Natal's inviting valleys, August herself would, like meteor surprise, stillness, unleashing brightness, bedecking shores with light beyond the magnificent beauty of Natal's unmistakable charm. Self-imposed rulers, regimes claiming supre supremacy on appearance, lined their power in regiments of terror to scare even the finest warrior to silence. Yet the meteor, in her breathtaking distinction, danced undeterred by the moon's glaring gaze. Tyrants in tempestuous disdain stood dumbfounded as freedom's meteoric voice relentlessly heralded through dark tyrannical days the cries of her homeland raised. Amantla, awetu, maibuye, i Africa. One August, on Africa's courteous horizons, an entire regiment worthy of decoration, regal, solid, gracious, stood contained in one incomparable pearl. Her beauty resides not with Foley. The velocity of her intention cuts through stratospheres, taking to the core where truth resides, shedding warmth, planting with maternal care, setting ablaze with love, conquering pretentious, pretentiousness with truth. The meteor provokes from those who encounter her, a burst of transcendent company. Those of earthly disposition claim a shooting star, a shooting star, make a wish. But a wish changes no one. This is no ordinary meteor. This august meteor draws all heavenward to her very source, beseeching prayer elevating benediction. O oh God, from thy infinite love, we thank you. That one ordinary August day, a meteor came our way, and upon seeing her, we have never been the same. Amen. We invite those who have been selected to come and present the intentions of this particular and holy moment.
who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that she can now be admitted to the company of the saints. We pray to the Lord. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face, we pray to the Lord. Love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for our departed brothers. Cleanse them of their sins and grant them the fullness of redemption. We ask this, this through Christ our Lord.
faith where we receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this particular time, we invite all only Catholics to receive communion. And Catholics that have prepared themselves sufficiently and well to receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for your understanding.
coronavirus variant has been detected in South Africa. The individual was a traveler who returned. Let's pray.
former first lady and the former first lady Mrs. Anela Mbeki, Her Excellency, former Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nuga, Honorable Minister of Social Development, Melindiwe Zulu, Honorable MEC of Finance and E Government. Ms. Nomantu Nkomo Rale Hoko, Acting Secretary General of the African National Congress and Treasurer General of the ANC, Mr. Paul Mashatile, members of the Diplomatic Corps, the family of Ambassador Mabuza, ladies and gentlemen, those of us who are joining us viewing from home, good morning. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you this morning to the funeral service of Ambassador Lindiwe Mabuza. My name is Zengeziwe Msimang, and I'm joined by Lindiwe Sangweni Sido, who will be co-program directing with me this morning. We're honored to be directing this program, which is for this consummate diplomat, illustrious author and poet, fierce feminist, formidable revolutionary mother, grandmother, sister, and friend to so, so many. Ambassador Mabuza was a force of nature. She was a maestro, a woman who walked her own path, a woman who conducted her own choir, and a woman who danced to her own tune. She was like no one else that I have ever met. She was a keen orchestrator of things, a planner, a coordinator, someone who brought people together and was able to keep them together. A few short weeks ago, Goko Lindi called all of her friends and family together for a celebration for her homecoming. 
Now, I'm going to say that again. Ambassador Mabuza called all of her friends and family together for her own homecoming. She planned her own farewell. Now, in typical Goko Lindy fashion, she was meticulous, planning what drinks should be served, what food should be prepared, and even what animals should be slaughtered. All of this without leaving her bed. When the ceremonial sheep that would be slaughtered was shown to her, she exclaimed, Oh my goodness, what an elegant sheep. It is the most beautiful sheep that I have ever seen. Well done, my darlings, on finding such a truly elegant sheep. In the family, we now all refer to it as the elegant sheep. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the saying that says, uh, it's by a friend of Coco Lindy's, Maya Angelou. People may forget what you wore, people may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Ambassador Mabuza had the ability to make everybody feel so, so special. Whether it was a colleague, a friend, one of her many, many grandchildren, she had the ability to make you feel like no one else on earth. Now, before I go any further, I think it's important that I inform you, and I don't expect any surprised expressions here, that Goko Lindy actually planned today. So a few months ago, about two months ago, she called her dear friend, her dear brother, her confidant, and her priest, Father Lawrence. And as, he was lying with, as she was lying in her hospital bed, and she said to him, Standwa we have some planning to do. There is a funeral that we must prepare for. And now there's only one part of this funeral today that Goko Lindy didn't plan herself, and that is for us to listen to her in her own words. So we have a video that we'll be playing, um, which is Ambassador Lindy Wemabuza in her own words. Virago Diop of Seneca. Listen more often to things rather than beings. Hear the fire's voice. Hear the voice of water. In the wind, hear the sobbing of the trees. It is our forefathers breathing. The dead are not gone forever. They are in the paling shadows and in the darkening shadows. The dead are not beneath the ground. They are in the rustling tree, in the murmuring wood in the flowing water, in the still water, in the lonely place, in the crowd, the dead are not dead. Listen more often to things rather than beings. Hear the fire's voice, Hear the voice of water in the wind. Hear the sobbing of trees. It is the breathing of our forefathers who are not dead, not beneath the ground, not gone. The dead are not gone forever. They are in the woman's breast, a child's cry, a glowing ember. The dead are not dead, not beneath the earth. They are in the flickering fire, in the weeping plant, in the groaning rock, in the wooded place the home, the dead are not dead. 
listen more often to things rather than beings. Hear the fire's voice, hear the voice of water. In the wind, hear the sobbing of the trees. It is the breathing of our forefathers. I thank you. And that was Auntie Lindiwe in true poetic prose. How blessed we are that we can reach out to our IT platforms and still have the wonderful memories that she left for us in her own voice. Zeng and I were reminiscing yesterday in the evening as we prepared for today. And I was remembered of growing up in Zambia, Lusaka, in the mid-1970s, when I, as a child, and many of us first met Auntie Lindiwe. Auntie Lindiwe arrived in Lusaka, Zambia with great aplomb, making an impact on many, many young people. She knew how to make us all feel special. We were all part of a group called Masupatze, the Young Pioneers managed and trained and formed by our Auntie Rita Fenyana, also one of the aunties in Lusaka at the time. Auntie Lindy made it a point that all children in the ANC families that lived in Lusaka felt that she was their auntie. She loved children of all the comrades, and they all adored her. She made it a point that if you loved something, she encouraged you to think big. So if you love sports, she would say, one day you'll represent a liberated South Africa as you become a gold medalist at the Olympics. Or you would say to her, Auntie, I think I'd like to be a hotelier. And she would say, that's wonderful, Standwa. After all, Who'll own and manage all our hotels when we come back to a free South Africa? She made us all feel we were indomitable, ready to meet the world with any challenges thrown our way. Her endorsements, lathered, and expressions of love brimming and brewing inexhaustibly, always pushing us to be the best versions of ourselves. All of us as young Masupatsela, never tired of dreaming, of what we would become, opera singers, gymnasts, astronauts, pilots, simply anything we dared to imagine. In more recent times, when I sat at her bedside, where she started penning her memoirs, she said, and I quote, we don't just open doors for those who will come after us. We do so for those standing right next to us, still trying to decide what to do for themselves. If we jump, they might too." Unquote. Auntie Lindy was deployed as a journalist working for Radio Freedom, using the airwaves to transmit revolutionary messages to the people back here home in South Africa. She decided that the best way to do this was with the spoken word, and on many occasions, she used poetry. And so she quickly went about training and teaching all of us young people in the Masupatsela how to write poetry. We would often be invited to make contributions, sometimes in the publications of Voice of the Women, Vow, and ANC publications of Malibongwe. All of this made you feel you could do anything you dreamt to be. She knew how to endorse, empower, build confidence in the formative years of young people that she interacted with. As you presented her with your poetry, eagerly awaiting her feedback, she would listen, she would ask you to repeat, you would recite again, and then she would go about making suggestions on how you could improve your rendition. Until Lindy was poetry in motion. 
And so today, what better way but to illustrate this and to ask her granddaughter, Mtutugile Msibi, to come up here and read a poem that was specially selected by Auntie Lindiwe for this day. Mtutu? Good morning all. This is a poem by Jared Manley Hopkins to a young child. Mother, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? Leaves like the things of man. You, with your fresh thoughts, care for? Can you? Ah, as the heart grows older, it will come to such sights colder, by and by, nor spare a sigh. Though worlds of one wood leaf meal lie, and yet you will weep and know why. Now, no matter, child, the name, sorrow's springs are the same. No mouth had, no no mind expressed what heart heard of, ghost guessed. It is the blight man was born for. It is mother you mourn for. Mother, are you grieving over golden leaves? I am leaving. Thank you. If I may ask for um, some musical notes by the Regina Mundi Youth Choir. Beautiful, beautiful friendship that existed between Ambassador Mabuza and Ambassador Masagela. Theirs is a friendship that spanned six decades and has been such a blessing 
for all of those who have gotten to behold it. Auntie Barbara and Goko Lindy are soul friends, a friendship that's so deep that the word family or sisters is more apt. I used to love listening to conversations between these two who shared a mutual love of reading and poetry. They love going to watch plays together, anything artistic. I would often look at them whispering at family functions and events, leaning over, one saying something to the other and then bursting into a giggle and wonder what it is that they were laughing at or perhaps who. It is my honor to ask Ambassador Mas Masekela to please come and pay her tribute to her dear friend. friends. Today is a very difficult day for us all, but it is also a day when we celebrate the life of our sister, our mother, our friend, our leader, Lindy Wemabuza. Kembi, Ntutu, Sifiso. Thank you for share, letting me share your mother and your grandmother with you. Tembi, I tell everybody that you are my daughter because when you came to the United States to live with your mother, I was working in New York at the time, and I remember very clearly, vividly, the little girl worried and anxious because she was arriving in a country she did not know to live with a mother whom she had not seen for many years. I want you to know that although your mother is gone, we are going to live on her memories. You are going to keep her alive and we are going to push you not to be like your mother, but to represent all the things that she valued in life. To make her proud as you already have done in your own life. When I saw these steps, I wondered whether I would be able to fulfill my promise to my friend. I was so worried how I was going to go up those stairs. So I was told, I sent a note to somebody who told me, no, don't worry, auntie, you just have to sit, to stand here at the bottom. So thank you for that. In the past week, since our dear Lindy Wemabuza left us, all of us have revisited all the places we've been together with her in body and in spirit. We have commented on how she carried herself so that 
those around her would always know she was a woman warrior of South Africa, a country that she loved fiercely and without reserve, a country for whose people she labored in the snow, in the monsoons, in the sunshine, in the rain, in Sweden, in Tanzania, in Lusaka, Malaysia, Washington, D.C., and all over the world. She was a voice of South Africa telling the world about the inequities and the oppression that our people were suffering and devoting all her strength to making freedom possible. She was sustained by Oliver Tambo's lodestar. His most beloved phrase, I always tell, tell people, his lodestar was the courage and the sacrifice of the people of South Africa. In every speech that he made, he spoke about that courage and he spoke about that sacrifice. I want to say from the start that um, Lindy Wemabuza did not join the ANC in 1975. And that is something that we have to correct on the web. Lindiwe Mabuza, like most South Africans, was a political person and was aware <coughs> and very much intimate with the history of South Africa. Indeed, when she went to the United States, in 1961, the Shopville massacre had already taken place. And it was not the first outrage against the people of South Africa. It was just that it was the one that was mostly noted because, <clears throat> excuse me, it led to the banning of the African National Congress and it led to the beginning of the international solidarity against the apartheid regime because it was after that that the sanctions began against apartheid South Africa. Quiet as it's kept, Lindiwe Mabuza was a very religious person. She believed in God. She was a staunch member of the Catholic Church. And as a young woman, she joined the Grail, an, a, an organization called the Grail, which was set up by a Jesuit priest who believed that the role of women in the church and in society needed to be acknowledged. He also believed that women were not given an opportunity in the church to serve, to be priests, to serve in the church. This organization, the Grail, was also um, characterized by the fact that they, the women who joined it worked within the community. Thus, when Lindy Wee got a scholarship through the Grail, to study at the 
community, the Grailville Community College, she began to learn how to mobilize people, but she, in this case, she was mobilizing the poor to help themselves. At the time she was at the University of Minnesota teaching there, after graduating from Stanford University with a, a, a master's degree in literature and from Minnesota in sociology. She had two master's degrees. She kept her scholarship and her intellectual activities a bit private in the beginning, but she couldn't quite suppress them. And we know that uh, after her retirement, she really focused on her literary work, both her own creation, and promoted the literary work of South Africans that she met. We know that Lindy was a very, very bright student. She went to Stanford University, an Ivy League college in, in, in the United States, because she won a scholarship to go there. She was actually also a Fulbright scholar. It is during those years in the 60s that she became very radical. In the United States, we know, in South Africa, I've already said we'd had Shockville. In the United States, there was the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King, who believed in nonviolent protest and led many campaigns against uh, racial discrimination. It was felt by some that he was too mild and that the violence against the African Americans had been so horrendous that there was a need to fight in another way. So that led to the Black Power Movement. And soon thereafter, we know that in San Francisco, the more radical Black Panther Party was formed in Chicago and San Francisco. We know that at the time there was the arrest of Angela Davis, that there was an anti-Vietnam War campaign in the United States, and that at the same time, the feminist movement was unfolding all over the world. I say all of this to say that Lindy We was a member of what, a full member of whatever community she lived in. So that by the time she came to the ANC, she had been radicalized. Unlike the youth, some of the youth today, and some other people who are not youth today, who are not really aware of where, what's happening where they are, they are, of what is happening to the people who live with them in that space. Lindy Wemabuza was always involved in community. And it was in the ANC that she was able to realize the full potential of her powers. Lindy Wemabusa loved artists. She loved painters singers of all genres, sculptors, actors, craftspeople, filmmakers, ceramicists, playwrights, writers, poets, designers, all creators. 
because she was a religious human being, she loved artists because artists represented to her those people who were able to reflect the glory of the God that she believed in with their art. But also they were able to represent the people of God with whom, with whose poverty, suffering, sacrifice, she identified fully. She worshipped at the altar of beauty, ensuring that those who had the talent to make beauty were made known to the world at large. From the days before the fax machine and when long distance calls had to be booked and, and, and an overseas call had to go via a colonial mother country, Lindywe was always mad for art and its efficacy to win support for, for the struggles of people all over the world, but in particular of South Africans. She traveled as a representative of the ANC in Sweden. She traveled to Tanzania regularly because she had discovered the beauty of the Makonde sculptures. So she would go to Tanzania every year to buy the sculptors and, and take them to Sweden to exhibit to the Swedish people and also to raise funds for the African National Congress. This was in addition to her daily work as a chief representative in the Scandinavian countries. She wrote volumes of poetry, edited books on President O. R. Tambo and, 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 and President Tabombegi, even throwing in a book on South African animals and a collection of letters from children reared in exile in Lusaka. She helped to organize Midu in Botswana, the Festival of Culture and Resistance, which was a forerunner for the festival in Amsterdam called Culture in Another South Africa in 1985, which was organized with the anti-apartheid movement in the Netherlands. She signed on South African greats like Abdullah Ibrahim, Miriam Makeba, Jonas Gwangwa, and many others, to utilize their talent in, in supporting the struggle for liberation. After our first democratic elections, she became a member of the first pal democratic parliament of South Africa. And a year later, she was appointed South African ambassador to the Republic of Germany. In his tribute to Lindiwe a few days ago, Kaifa Semenya spoke passionately about how she organized a tour of South African artists called Buwa to perform in several capitals on the African continent, raising funds for the final leap into freedom. I agree with his concluding note that there are several outstanding books which should be written with every chapter and verse of Lindy Wey's life and works. I first met Lindy Wey in Los Angeles at the house of Kaifa Semenya and Letambulu in 1970. She had been living and working in the Midwest for several years, longing for her only child, her daughter Tembi, and alone in the heart of the American country, she was sick of being part of an oppressed minority and looking for people from South Africa.
from home. It was summertime and Lindy was, was on vacation from her teaching job at Ohio University. I was recuperating at my brother's house after a car accident in Lusaka where I was studying at the University of Zambia. I had just been reunited with my son, Mabusha, who was only five years old and living with his uncle. There was a very small South African community in Los Angeles including people like Sis Tulam Daweni, who was a, a nursing sister, and Philemon Ho, who was a mu musician. We all met Lindy, and as was the case in Erzal, we were soon meeting at the Semenyas almost daily, and poor Letta was cooking meals for us, and every day we were there because we wanted to be with Lindy Wen. We all formed a very close association with her. I chatted with her about my abundant literary studies at the University of Zambia, and we talked for hours about literature, especially Nigerian writers like Chinua Achebe, Wole Soyinga, Cyprian Ikwensi, and many others, and I was amazed at her incisive and precise scholarship. It was not long before Lindy we decided that I had to be taken in hand to complete my degree at Ohio where she was teaching. She was thoroughly unimpressed with my lazy recuperation and instructed Hugh to buy me and Mabusha tickets to join her in Athens where she was teaching at Ohio University in the African American Studies Department. The rest is history. I gained an elder sister and a mentor, and Mabusha gained an aunt who has been part of our lives for many decades now. Reading Lindy West's speech at Adelaide Tambo's funeral, I am struck by the similarity of these two peerless comrades. What she says of Mrs. Tambo is as if she is describing herself without knowing that she is doing so. She says of Mama Adelaide Tambo, she loved and was loved by all. At the same time, supremely, effortless, effortlessly juggling all these roles in equal measure with the same degree of caring, of giving, of loving, of course ever ready to prune, to chop, to weed, to water, and like any gardener, cut into shape with necessary scoldings and reprimands as each season demanded. And that was exactly, that was what she, those were her words at Mrs. Tambo's funeral. But she was also unknowingly, or knowingly, describing herself. She continues, now speaking of Mrs. Tambo's Christianity, as quote, not of the inflexible orthodox variety, for has found accommodation for the worth and value of our indigenous religious belief and knowledge system, systems. Often, when I would return to Gauteng, Sisi made the time to take me to Tamboville Cemetery to report my return to Budi. But as many would have noted, elegance and drama were as natural to Sis Adelaide as breathing. These were the hallmarks that made her the lady she was. And this too is true of Lindy Wen. So she may have planned the service 
but she also really planned to put the words in our mouths of what we had to say. But I think, I don't know if I would have quoted this if Lindy were, were still alive. But I think that one of the most interesting and revealing quotations was made by our former president, Oliver Tambo. He was speaking of the time when Lindywe was appointed to become the chief representative in Sweden. I quote, women in the ANC should stop behaving as if there was no place for them above the level of certain categories of involvement. They have a duty to liberate us men from antique concepts and attitudes about the place and role of women in society and the development and direction of our revolutionary struggle. In fear of being a failure, Comrade Lindywe Mabuza cried and sobbed and ultimately collapsed on top of herself when she learned she had been appointed ANC chief representative to the Scandinavian countries. But looking at the record, could any man have done better? Indeed, we asked that question about her life. Could any man have done better? Lindy Ware designed a new template for the job description of, the ANC, of ANC chief representative when she took up her work in Sweden. And I dare say that even if we acknowledge that the world political and social context had changed drastically in 1979, or that comparatively speaking, Sweden was a progressive social democratic country ready for an ANC chief representative we must still admit that she made a great lead forward for everyone to recognize the efficacy of the arts in the battle against apartheid. Lindiwe had a, a, a vision of the dream of human solidarity universally that was articulated by Oliver Tambo. She actualized that. She is one of the ANC chief representatives who actualized it and changed, and changed the work of chief representatives all over the world by her use of culture. I think they want me to stop, and I will. <laughs> Uh, but I must say a few more things. I just want to say that Lindywe touched many lives. I'm not going to talk about her fashionable dress because we had enough of that this week when everybody, when, when the most beautiful pictures of her in all her color and glory were all over WhatsApp. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I don't know how my life will be without Lindy Ware and indeed how many of our lives will be. Very few people can scold me, and she was one of them. And I listened to her. But also she is my dear friend with whom we could discuss literature, poetry, novels. We could discuss politics for hours and hours and hours. And I wish
wish I could say that when she left us, she was happy with the state of our country. I wish I could say that. I wish I could say she was not sad about South Africa. I wish I could say that she was a little hopeful. But all I can say is that she was loyal to the ANC and she could not imagine South Africa without the ANC. I need not say more. I think we all know what our duty is. I hope that my friend, my sister, rests in peace. I know she will rest in peace. And once more, President Becky, Treasurer General Mashatile, former Deputy President Pumzile Muka Mlambo, Ambassador Tandi Rankwe, Ambassador Tenjiwe Mtinso, I can't see properly, and Lindiwe's family, who love her so much, and in particular, Usis Angela Sangweni, who has lost a lot. She not only lost her husband, but now she has lost her beloved sister-in-law. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Auntie. We lose time with the protocols of cleansing and removing masks. Thank you so much to Ambassador Barbara Masikela, Auntie Barbara, for taking us through a journey that we probably not many of us know about, particularly the close and intimate friendship that you shared with Auntie Lindiwe Mabuza. Auntie Lindiwe lived with many children, as you've probably guessed from Auntie Barbara's uh, tribute to her friend. She had children living together in Ohio, where she was a professor. Uh, Tembi, together with Tembi's late brother, Gugum Sibi, were surrounded by the love of other children, brothers like Muntu, Kaifas and Leta Simenya's child, but also Mabusha Masigela, who used to stay also with Auntie Lindy. We are told that at the age of 10, Mabusha would have probably asked Auntie Lindy, tell me about Africa. And in true Auntie Lindy style, the answer was never a very simple answer. She wrote him a poem. He's not 10 years old, he's much older today. He's going to read that poem. Mabusha. As a child, I was always struck by the fact that in exile, nobody ever said we were going back to South Africa. Everybody always said we're going home. That always touched me. Africa to me. I prefer no other continent but Africa. Each has its peaks and rolling legends chiseled by their own blacksmiths, colored in dyes of their own ocean's roar and calm. But I prefer no other continent but Africa, a vast question mark for zealots of color, dappled with Kilimanjaro snows that have melted secrets deep into its locked gorges. 
gorgeous with Mediterranean capes, capped with enormous mother's breasts for all creation's creatures. I prefer nowhere else to stir but Africa. Hot cradle of desire constrained by periods stained with sweat and particular blood. Africa, serene love and bounty. Honey that draws with the splendor of silence. Not birds that orchestrate with wind wings and words, but lowing herds of slithering stampedes that brazed and bonded her vastness within the scorching exchange within the bracketing embraces of stone love at noon. But again, I nurse no preferences but those heart-shaped platforms where bronzes and browns and all brawny shoulders brain. Africa to the future, as lustrous as her undiscovered wealth, and where all brains steer her with steel hands to the waves in the horizon, begging yes, to unconceived pregnancies that are also open-mouthed flowers. I prefer no one continent but Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Mabusha. Ambassador Mabuza was a diplomat par excellence. She traversed the globe fighting for the liberation of our country using her sharp intellect, formidable voice, and amazing organizational skills. Her revolutionary political education was a lifelong journey. And on this journey, there are two exemplary leaders with whom Ambassador Mabuza's story is inextricably linked. Both of them amongst the best leaders that our continent has produced. One is Oliver Reginald Tambo, her mentor and the longest serving president of the African National Congress. And the other is the former president of the African National Congress and the former president of South Africa, President Tabo Mbeki. If I may please ask you to come and give your tribute to Ambassador Mabuza. I've just been told uh, I can speak for an hour. <laughs> but program directors and uh, our religious leaders, Father Dumi Sojiani and Father Mdutuzi Lores Njovu, and fellow mourners. We know that South Africa faces many problems. I think all of us hear this message every day about very deep concern of the people about the levels of corruption. I think all of us know this very well that uh, one of the big problems is the levels of poverty. There are parts of the country as you move around where even before you arrive at a place you can smell poverty. And all of us, I'm sure, have been very concerned about a degree of lawlessness, not lack of respect for the law. Now they're appointing, they're accusing fingers. 
accusing fingers were pointing at Lindy West organization for all of these ills. We are pointing at the ANC. Barbara was right. She was being very gentle. That Lindy was desperately unhappy. Desperately unhappy to see her organization presiding over that kind of reality. And indeed felt that that accusing finger was pointing at all of us, including herself. But I think fortunately the, uh, the ANC had understood, I think, had come to understand the challenges it faced in this regard. And as you know, at this last National Congress in 2017, it took an important decision for its renewal. And I'm really hoping that the leadership of the ANC will act on that, that renewal. We have been, I at least have been using a, a borrowed phrase in that context. That the ANC must aim, in terms of that process of renewal, for a new reality about itself. That it must recognize that it carries in its ranks people who carry the title, ANC members, who wear ANC t-shirts, who toy toy very well and sing freedom songs very well, but were not ANC. That it needs to liberate itself from that kind of person. And so I've been saying that I've been, I borrowed a phrase from somewhere that in that process of renewal, the ANC must say, better, fewer, but better. I'm quite certain that uh, at Lindy were lived, she would be among that fewer who would remain, but better. Because who she was and what she represented, the kind of person that Barbara has just spoken about. If one wanted to say, when you talk about an ANC cater, what kind of person are you talking about? Many of us who knew her would point at Lindy Way and say, Lindy Way Mabuza is what we mean when we talk about the cater of the ANC. About what we mean when we talk about a servant of the people. Because she had demonstrated that she had proved herself in that capacity in many ways. In many ways that we know. as a diplomat of the movement and a diplomat of the Republic, of the Democratic Republic, the matter that Barbara, very important matter Barbara has just mentioned, the use of the arts, in order to make sure that we achieve a particular kind of liberation, informed by a certain level of humanity, with a conscience, Correctly, our program directors here have spoken about Lindy Ware's commitment to feminism. It said in her biography that, uh, correctly, that at some point she edited uh, a magazine of the, South of the ANC Women's Section, what was it, then the AMC Section in Exile, The Voice of Women. 
and added quality and content to that very important journal, Vow, the Voice of Women. She had an outstanding organizing capacity. Wherever she has served, in all of these places that Barbara has mentioned, whether in the Sweden and Scandinavia or in the US or Germany or Malaysia and, and everywhere else, always managed to organize people behind the struggle behind the African National Congress. And I think it's because people instinctively believed her. They believed in this beautiful future for South Africa that she talked about and were prepared to go along with her. I'm saying had she lived the process of renewal, following this prescript of better, fewer, but better, would have left Lindy Way as one of its members. And as part of our grief today, that as we have to carry out that task of repositioning the ANC to where it ought to be, she will not be there. Not only as an activist in that particular process, but as an example. As an example of what kind of ANC are we trying to create? We would say that that, that ANC is represented by this one, Lindwe Mabuz. I'm saying that's part of the sadness that she has left us. But I think we know what it is she said we must do. And obviously, I think we must do it. That process of renewal, so that the ANC becomes the instrument for which she lived, for which she worked so hard, for which she most mobilized so many millions of people around the globe to support. Tembi, yeah, the Mabuza family, the Msimangs. Yeah, I'm glad, uh, Barbara, you mentioned uh, the Sanguinis. Uh, our sincere condolences. Uh, I think the country, the nation, has also lost a giant. But surely, surely, we will follow the example she has set. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Mbeki. Next, we have musical notes. Um, we will be having a plea for Af Africa, which is by Bokwe. It was written by Knox Bokwe, a South African journalist, a Presbyterian minister, and one of the most celebrated Sahim writers and musicians. He was also the father of our dearest auntie, Yolisa Modise. Um, and Plea for Africa is being sung this morning by um, Zandile Mzazi, who is a soprano accompanied by the Chamber of the Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra.
Thank you so much. Ambassador Mahosa loved children. She adored them. young people generally, but she had a particularly soft spot for the little ones who simply loved to bask in her glorious smile. Tutu and Sviso were the center of Goko's heart. She simply adored them and was instrumental in raising them and also in giving them the opportunity to be raised across the world. Here to pay tribute to their darling Goko, I'd like to ask Mtutu and Sfiso to come up and give you a tribute. My understanding is that some of the other grandchildren will be coming with you. I could assign myself as many years as there are stars adorning the night sky to write an adequate speech. It feels that the struggle would remain nonetheless. How could I condense such a wondrous life into a single memorial address? To quote Her Excellency Ambassador Lindue Mabuza on the subject, poetry is a part of the struggle. You recite a poem it's better than a three-hour speech. It gets to the heart of the matter. It moves people. Considering that, I'll accept her final invitation, invitation graciously. As you depart the cooled embers of your mortal coil, I'll grieve. A morning star, radiant and splendorous, cultivating tender saplings into thriving woodlands, their fledgling stems growing ever deeper and expansive, rooted into the heart of the African soil, I'll grieve. A baobab tree, mighty in stature, its heavenward branches caressing the skyline's lips, giving succor to the nesting birds and roving mammals, weary from their toiling travels, anchoring themselves against the season's perils, I'll grieve. An elephant cow, matriarchal and hefty, guiding the herd to graze at pastures evergreen, mothering orphaned calves, availing your knowledge and affections to their upbringing. I'll grieve. For wonder too close and a bright stalk scorches, a mighty tree casts shade, an elephant charges. You're spirited away facing the final mystery that greets us all. Your memories remain, playing a pale shadow of the Colossus you were. I'll grieve. To have known you beyond your defense was beyond me. The scorching, the shade and the charges conjured a chasm, too vast for crossing, too steep for climbing, a primeval crater aging with each generation passing, keeping score and counting wounds. I'll grieve. For it was harsh conditions, punishing systems, tormenting structures that resigned your very humanity to the fringes in lieu of a white patriarchal hegemony. You embodied the counter-revolutionary, the vanguard of rebellion, our rebellion, entrenching our birthright that on our land we be seen, we be heard, we be. No wonder you returned home with war wounds then, visited by conflicts not easily unaffixed, the residual trauma transformed into a fortress from which we groped and grasped desperately for connection, akin to two ships adrift, I'll grieve. Not only for you, I mourn for we. 
lamenting the unfulfilled promise of, a, of profound love that could not come to pass. For country called, and you were taught, was to pour forth every ounce, every drop wrung, seldom stepping to replenish your own cup, or taking stock of your unresolved ordeals, and settling spectres before they haunted our intimate bonds. I'll grieve. Though our story had blazes of fondness, it was no sanctuary. Reflected of your grueling reality, a truth half finished, I'll grieve. For though I sing songs to ululate in the world you bequeathed, that world, threaded by your sacrifice, lacerates at the seams. Finn. My grandmother and her generation of stalwarts offered everything, every expense to realize the total, re to the total liberation of South Africa and her peoples. No cost was too excessive. Whether it was the demands set on her body, the burdens pressed upon her mental well-being, the pressures on her spirit, or even the tensions bearing down on her family dynamics and how she related to us, her children, no cost was too excessive. Standing God at her passing, I feel a bittersweet felicity that her efforts were soundly acknowledged by every division of society. Despite that, there will come a time yet where I will be held accountable for my, I'll be held accountable for her, for my personal capacity to affect power. She's carried her portion. The rest lies on us. Therefore, I'll leave the congregation with some final contemplations. Gogolindi's dream has been deferred. In her final years, her party, the ANC, was now in disarray and health steep in decline. She was dismayed at the hyper-normalization of state capture, the looting of state funds and corruption festering within state sovereignty. This juxtaposed with a soaring inequality divide, record unemployment, and the dissolution of consistent qualitative service delivery from the state and how it affects the most marginalized of our society, agonized her spirit. That says nothing of the ongoing legacy of apartheid that remains unanswered, unanswered from corporate South Africa's cultural ideology and systems to land accessibility and ownership. Even the lack of easily attainable mental health care is damning. She conveyed, her tormented she conveyed her tormented disposition, resulted by the stark reality of our current state of affairs, her, her beloved country far removed from the bold collective vision curated by Oatambo, herself, and the other ANC stalwarts. She and the dead are entitled to far better. Is it then permissible to overlook this discomforting truth in celebrating her life? If we are to honor Ambassador Mabuza's memory, we must recollect that her substance was married to her aesthetics. Her values went beyond pomp and circumstance. Today, as we lay her to rest and cast the spotlight on her many accolades, whether party or nation, diplomat or civilian, artist or entrepreneur, colleague or comrade, family or friend, if we are to honor Dr. Lindy Mabuza in all her splendor, all her complex humanity, in her capacity to sacrifice it all and love regardless, then a vision for South Africa must be upheld vigilantly, vigilantly outside the confines of this memorial. The country, the society that asked for her utmost must pay it back to its citizens in tenfold, living up to Mabu Lindiwe Mabuza's polished and yielding standards. Rest in power, princess. May you finally attain the respite you so graciously deserve. In our household, we have a running joke that no one should ever speak after Spiso has spoken. I think today we all understand why. <laughs> Your Excellencies, the clergy, beloved family and friends, good morning. Lindiwe Mabuza, Ambassador, Doctor, Comrade, Auntie, Mommy, Goko. For any other person, all these titles would have a distinct personality. But not with my grandmother. Goko was consistent in every role 
and in every space that she occupied. She did so with excellence and to the best of her ability. And she expected and encouraged the same of all those who surrounded her. As expected with regular grandmothers, she could knit, sew, bake, and do all the tasks that one would have expected of her. Well, she didn't do this with us. <laughs> but dare you buy anything of inferior quality, you would get the full wrath of our grandmother. She would detail what is incorrect with every stitch, hem, or ingredient. I recall a time when we were at a function at the residence in London. Goko could not get over the fact that someone had brought her granddaughter a fake leather bag. That culprit was her daughter. And since stubbornness runs in the family, this meant that I was caught in the middle of a heated debate about what the characteristics are that constitute a genuine leather bag. Nobody won, and needless to say, I've never used that bag ever since. My peers would often not understand why I would interact with Goko with such earnestness and conviction. I struggled to articulate that Goko never wanted to be treated like a fool, or you would be the one who'd be made the fool out of. Goko was someone who was always sharp and astute. One thing she could absolutely not stand for was cerebral laziness. If you willingly chose not to apply your mind, that was far more of an offense than if you were just plainly ignorant. This is why Goko being diagnosed with the onset of dementia in 2015 was one of our greatest horrors as a family. We knew that along with her heart, one of her most treasured nat natural attributes was her brilliant mind. During this period, I recall a time when I was visiting home in Pretoria, having just come back from university. Mom, who was fearful about Goko's declining mental condition, made it very clear that I needed to put time aside to see my grandmother. I sat with her and spoke to her in length about everything that was going on in Cape Town, about how university was, about how my friends were, and throughout our catch-up session, I noted that Goko wasn't really paying attention. Her eye contact strayed away, as though she was preoccupied by everything else in the room other than our conversation. At that point, I stopped mid-sentence to check. How, Goko? Are you still following? To this, she simply smiled, took a long pause. To this, she simply smiled and took a long pause before responding in the most soberly, yet gentle fashion. I noted that you have a new crutch word. If that makes sense, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. It seems like you don't have any confidence in what you're saying. From that point, I realized that Goko was not hit with any case of dementia, but that dementia was hit with a case of Goko Lindy. Needless to say, the phrase, if that makes sense, has ceased to feature in my vocabulary, if that makes sense. Life didn't always make sense. Our beloved Goko had trauma, as many did. And we, as her immediate family, in some ways bore the brunt of that. As much as my grandmother was a loving individual, she was a person who experienced inner turmoil, which I believe she herself wasn't always able to come to grips with. Our home environment wasn't always peaceful, and we would often experience the weight of the world, which she often carried on her shoulders. 
There were many pains Oko went through, like not being able to bury her mother and losing close friends and family across three different continents at the very least. As family, we understood. We had insight into Goko's life and the life of those who sacrificed everything for the struggle. Hence, we would often wonder how she and many comrades in her generation were able to smile and extend any form of kindness considering what they had experienced. You see, Goko wasn't a person who loved her country. She was a person who loved her people. So she gave every single part of herself to this very passion of others. With Goko, what was inspirational was how she dealt with that trauma. She was a true fighter. Like an artist, she expressed her greatest pain through poetry. She used any form of contempt as her greatest motivator to lift and build those around her instead of choosing to engage with any self-enriching activity that damaged the very communities her comrades died for. This she did consistently with everyone she interacted with, and she did so until her very final breath. It is heartbreaking to lose someone whom you love and who knows you and who knows you more than anyone or more than you even know yourself. But I think we all know what the appropriate way would be for us to honor her legacy, integrity, compassion, purpose, drive, honor, and elegance. There are very few times we get to meet an icon. I have the privilege of being a descendant of one. We are living in the world she sacrificed for and we cannot continue to watch it go to waste. Go well, Coco. Rest in peace. Thank you, Bandana. It's so beautiful to see the legacy that Gogo Lindy lives, leaves with her grandchildren and how eloquently they have conveyed the message of their grief, the message of their life with Gogo and the blessings that Gogo brought in their lives. I remember an occasion where my late father, Stan Sanguin, and his sister, my aunt Lindywe, debated the meaning of words found in a poem written by Professor Benedict Wallet Rilagazi. In fact, we are in Soweto, where one of the most famous streets is named after Professor Vilagazi. Professor Vilagazi is a famous South African Zulu poet, novelist, and educator. And before he died, at an early age of 44, we are told, he had written a poem called Mangifikwa Uwufa. And so I would listen to Auntie Lindy and my dad debating the meaning of the different words, Ngesizu, and interpreted into English, they would be talking about, if I should met, be met by my death, bury me under the cool shade of the weeping willow tree. They playfully jostled big words, Ngesizulu, challenging one another on the various meanings of the words. And so it is quite appropriate that today, this is one of the poems that she selected to be read. And today it will be recited by one of Tembi's best friends. We call her Mam Zandi. Zandi Mbele is also one of Auntie Lindy's adopted daughters. She will be reading Umangifikwa Ugu. <laughs> When death strikes, bury me beneath the lawn next to the willow tree. I'm going to recite a poem 
by Benedict Villagazi. Mangi fikwa ugufa. Gimbeleni pansi kochani. Duze nezislasa zomye zane. Lapo amakaja eongembe sanga makabunga tuelubushaza. Gozwa namingi lele pansi. Uchani nga pezu lubusheba. Lala standwa. Lala upumule. Gimbeleni pezu kwa madamu. La pamanze tule nganyagazi. Na la pizinyone zinganyana. Zishabelela, zishonge pimbo. Zenanela ugutuasa kwe shobo. Zeshe zipuza manza polile. La pilanga linge nisile. Giege ngifele zinle lenza bantu anabafundi skole. Jengo ba mashombe se shuleka imi tualo ebengi sindwa yiyo. Yiyo imi sindu ya bantuana etutuza impefumulo elele uglala ukupagate. Gimbe uleni endaweni enjena. Lapo izi ntungulo zolimi. Zengatazo. Zinge naktola sango. Lugwa shuga nisu mshaba. Zingi vuse ebutongwe ni obu ushe. Uma wena ofunda le mikana ungifika, ungimbele lapo, ucha ninga pezulu, buyoti, lala standwa, lala upumule. Lala standwa, lala upumule. That was beautifully rendered, Mamzandi. Thank you so much. Auntie Lindywe's family is big. Sometimes it's even difficult to call it an extended family. Sometimes it's even difficult to refer to an inner circle because everybody in her family is important. Her maternal grandmother's people come from the Kumalos. So some of you will hear her talking about Umakuman, who was her mother. You'll also hear about her, her, her patriarchal father, her, her father, who was a gentleman called Makalum Kambule. I won't go into too much detail, but we are told that Aunt Lindy had 11 siblings. He is in Dabazabandabanda. So, having had a father named Maclem Kambule means that Auntie Lindy biologically was a Kambule. Mac Kambule, as he was referred to, had a sister. Her sister, his, his sister, sorry, was called Lambase Kambule. Lambase Kambule married a one Robert Hugh Kumalo the grandfather of Mavuso Msimang. For those of you who've been wondering, how do these Msimangs, Mabuzas, Sangwenis, Don Don get together? We claim all of Amai Tagazir. Siaz Prenya Masiti, O Kuma, Lomantung, Ombulaza, Mashoban, Abatibel, Abantu, Bebebe Mnyenga, Ngezindaba. Siaz Prenya Futi Masito, Kambule, Ompangazit, Ongube, Amalandilanga. We are so proud about the family that weaves an intricate tapestry of them. Sibis, Auntie Lindy's mother, Elsie Sib Msibi, or Lonjo, who married Mabuza, or Dongagamavuso, them Simangs, Nongosi, Tabizolo, them Lifes, the Sowazis, or Langamandla, the Dembes, or Donga the Tulas, and many, many more. I welcome to the podium the tallest member in our family, Mavusom Simang, known to many of us as Uankum Muzi, to come up and speak for the family. Seabonga, Tabizolo, Nongos.
comrade uh, president of uh, past president Tabumbegisi uh, Zanele, comrade Mashatile, TG and acting SG, um, of course program directors, I should have started with you. Uh, all the people who are listening uh, here and those who are listening from the remoteness of their homes. Thank you very much. Throughout this week, the commentary on uh, Aunt Lindywe Mabuza's passing has been filled with uh, abundant praise for her manifold accomplishments. She embraced, supported, and flourished in the arts. She has been described as a diplomat par excellence, and this predates the period when she was formally appointed as ambassador or high commissioner. So many, many things were said in superlatives. The family is very delighted that you have, in our hour of grief, been able to console us and actually confirm our understanding of uh, who she was in character and in personality. We thank you very, very much. I can't help but include that uh, maybe an element of hype in this, but the ambassador of Sweden said something like, without Lindy where Sweden might not have been what it was towards South Africa. A little bit of hype, but that's fine. Now, at a slightly closer range, many will not, that many will not have heard. First, about this art collector. I wasn't aware of this aspect of her. You know, she went to the States and other places before we met. Rather, she was older than us. Um, and also having heard about the composition of the family, she grew up uh, where we didn't see her. So we went, I wasn't aware of this aspect of her uh, attribute as, a, as an art collector when I traveled on government business to London when she was high commissioner. You know, uh, I did say I would be coming and she immediately said I should live with her. Uh, stay with her for the period that I was there. But you didn't quite say no to her, so I agreed. As a rule, I pick up presents for people when I visit them at uh, the duty-free shop. Uh, a whiskey or a cognac or, or a fragrance, if I know the person, are the easiest things to choose. This time, well, I didn't know her fragrance, but also I wasn't going to buy her whiskey, so I went to the curio shop and picked up some um, carving. It wasn't expensive at all. Um, actually, it was a bit cheap, cheap uh, which I was going to present to her on arrival. I did that, and uh, she said, oh, Mozi, thank you, put it there. <laughs> so I, I knew exactly after looking at what was in that living room that uh, my gifts did not quite have a place there. And if I had a way, I would have really withdrawn drawn them very quickly and put them back into, into this thing. It was an African carving, all right, but not the Maconde that somebody was talking about here. So, that was my first experience at close encounter, in close encounter with Aunt Lindy. Then on a visit to Germany, I was very lucky to visit where she was, uh, where she was ambassador. I played on a disc um, music that I thought was beautiful, uh, a rendition of Nkosi uh, Sigalele Africa. I really will not say who had uh, done that piano rendition of it, which I thought was excellent. So uh, she said, who is playing that? I said, who it is? I said, oh, I said, where does he come from? 
So that's a person I understood later who had been invited by the apartheid government to play at the time of the boycott and he had agreed to do some music and that was the end of his relationship with uh, Aunt Lindy and that was the last time I myself also listened to that, uh, to that uh, recording. That's Aunt Lindy, anybody who t and, uh, plays around and uh, messes up with apartheid cannot entertain us, cannot sing our national, national anthem. So many people, uh, Lindy you've provoked me, talk about how large our family is. It is indeed very large. And Lindy Wemabuza, as has been said, and Uncle Stan Sangweni, known to many who are listening and present here, were siblings. Their father, Mac Kambulin. And Lindy's mom was a Miss Msibi who married because Kambule didn't marry her. Married a Mabuza. Stan's mother was a Makumalo. This Kambule also didn't marry her. So she went to marry a Sangweni. So great guys, these Mabuzas and the Sangwenis, because they picked up these two people and recognized them. Um, Tembi's father, Tembi here, the late George Msibi, well, was Msibi. Tembi's grandmother was a Msibi. So you have Aunt Lindy making a baby with Msibi, who is, uh, carries the mother's name. As Lindy said, in Tuzabandabatalalis, which we can't quite uh, talk about. Also, this uh, Kambule, Mac Kambule's father, that's uh, Stan's grandfather, was a Simeon Kambule who married a Miss Molefe. Molefe. Mac also married a Miss Molefe. Try and figure this out. So Mac Kambule, Stans and Lindy was delinquent father, was the brother to my maternal grandmother, Lambasa Kambule, who married uh, my grandfather called R.H. Uh, Kumalu. Their daughter, Sisonke, married Walter Msimang, my father, who was also not very good at retaining wives. Never mind. <clears throat> All this is in my generation, and I'm not really going to start talking about the rest of the other people who are in this house and who are elsewhere. The um, Kuzwayos, uh, th there is no end to them. Even the Soazis, and I'm home live, and so uh, That's a story for um, somebody else to tell. Now, our great little bit of my story, who we are, my great-great-grandparents, who were Job Kambule, Johannes Kumalo, Adam Molife, and Mavuso, Daniel Msimang, were converted to Christianity at a place called Mparane, near today's town of uh, Fixback. They traveled to Edendale, via Eswatini, because the king there had also said he wished to have his people uh, converted to Christianity, but he was also very interested in them um, uh, gaining literacy. They passed on to Indaleni from Swaziland when there were some problems, stayed at Indaleni because the colonial government was keen to give the land to Afrikaners, and so these missionaries uh, uh, had to proceed and they went to Edendale. So at Edendale, because these guys already had some education, association with uh, missionaries, they were artisans, 
they really were ahead of the curve when it came to entering the colonial market. People used to call them Amazemtiti because they were exempted from native laws, certain native laws. And that's a kind of something of an honor that they thought they were really regarded with. I don't have the permission of the family to say this, but I'm usually known to say things that are most of the time truthful. Uh, I'll inform you that Job Kambule was the first superintendent of Edendale settlement. That was a huge settlement like the hill towns, Amanzimtotis, all these places where Christians were, Amakoboga and so on. He was superintendent there, but they called him Induna because the uh, superintendent was reserved for the head of the Wesleyan missionaries. Now, he was very highly regarded. He'd been a teacher already, uh, earning 15 pounds a year uh, at Mparane. Uh, and so when he was appointed to this pos position as a convert, the understanding was that uh, he led a monogamous, monogamous, <laughs> monogamous life. Um, it turned out that he had a family in the village um, and when that was learned Kumalo suggested a special time of prayer for Edendale was the city of their solemnities and could not be allowed to slide into spiritual decrepitude so Job Kambule resigned, had to resign as, as superintendent. So when you hear about uh, Lindy Stans and many other people's father, via Mac Kambule, I think it's the Irish who say, what's bred in the bone um, comes out, I think, in the flesh. Uh, I would like to say also, the Msimangs come in in this way. Uh, this Daniel Msimam Mavuso uh, was a serious Christian. He established the mission in Mparane in Eswatin. That mission stands today, he built it, um, and it's a national monument, uh, uh, Swazi National Monument. Uh, he had a son by the name of Joel. And Joel had two sons, one of them called Richard, another one called um, Selby. So Joel, I think beginning to smell something about the hierarchy in the Methodist Church, established his own church. It was called the Independent Methodist Church in Swaziland. The sons, were the founder members of the African National Congress. Selbim Simang having been the first administrative secretary, not SG, while uh, Plaiki and Richard were entrusted with the task of documenting the difficulties that ex people experienced when, uh, as a result of the Native uh, Land Act of 1913. They compiled a huge, huge document which became, should be in the archives of the African National Congress. He also, having trained abroad, was the head lawyer responsible for putting together the constitution of the African uh, National uh, Congress. So, I just want to say that uh, the, what the president said, what uh, Sis Barbara said, what uh, the poet said here yeah, about the African National Congress. They are talking about an institution that's very close to this family, extremely so. And sometimes when certain people say things that are not terribly popular, it's because they believe that the ANC should remain what its founders wanted it to be. This is this family. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for those words, Dr. Msumang. Um, to give the obituary today, I would like to call on Dr. Sli Mayeza. Dr. Sli is one of the many young relatives that were raised um, by Gokolindi, um, a doctor by profession. There's this, I can never say this word, an anesthetist by profession. She flew down from Cape Town um, a few weeks ago to be with Gokolindi and to help the family and we're extremely grateful for her for being such a rock for Tembi and everyone um, in Goko's final days. If you will all please rise as Dr. Slee gives the obituary. The obituary of Lindiwe Mabuza. This was as written by her brothers, Mendim Simang and Stan Sangweni, for the nomination of their sister, Lindiwe Mabuza, for the national orders in October 2013, and completed by her granddaughter, Sisongkem Simang, December 2021. Ambassador Lindiwe Mabuza was a dedicated cater who gave her life to the cause of the liberation of, South of all South Africans. She gave the struggle against apartheid everything she had, her intellect, her enormous reserves of energy, and her sharp communication skills. Her weapons were art, music, and culture, and she wielded them with finesse. Born on August 13, 1934 in Newcastle, the daughter of Makalem Elijah Kambule and Elsie Mtudukile Msibi, Ambassador Mabuza attended primary school in Johannesburg and went to high school at St. Louis Bertrand High School in Newcastle. In 1955, she was admitted at Roma College in Lesotho and obtained her Bachelor of Arts degree. Following this, Ambassador Mabuza moved to Swaziland and became a teacher of English and Isizulu. She was guided in her passion for language by her mother, Uma Kumar, who raised her on a diet of Zulu philosophy and culture. Ambassador Mabuza left Swaziland in 1964 on a Fulbright scholarship that took her to Stanford University in California, where she studied for a master's degree in English literature. After she completed her program, Ambassador Mabuza moved to Ohio State University, where she became an associate professor, teaching courses in literature, history, and racial justice. She later went on to Minnesota, where she obtained a second master's degree in American studies. Ambassador Mabuza stayed on at the University of Minnesota to teach and taught sociology. She was part of a pioneering program, a proud African woman teaching Americans how to think about themselves. It was in Minnesota that she first experimented with using arts to capture the imaginations of those who needed liberation. She worked with a group of at-risk students, teaching them creative writing and poetry. Her time in America was formative. During these years, Ambassador Mabuza began to reflect on the cruelty of the regime that had taken power in South Africa when she was a teenager, and she increased her participation in the international anti-apartheid movement. She quickly built linkages between African Americans and South Africans. It was the civil rights era, and solidarity was quickly forged. In 1977, at great financial and personal risk to herself, Ambassador Mabuza cut short her academic career and joined the ANC in a full-time capacity. That year, she moved to Lusaka in order to be based at the headquarters of the ANC. She was soon deployed in the ANC's communications department where she became a journalist and researcher for Radio Freedom. She recorded poems and messages using her skills to devastating effect in stinging verbal attacks against the regime. She also became an active participant in writing for and editing The Voice of the Women, an ANC journal. Between 1977 and 1979, Ambassador Mabuza chaired the ANC's cultural committee, contributing enormously to the ANC's active decision to use culture as a terrain of struggle. She played an important part in raising the profile of the Amanda singing troupe during this period, and she worked tirelessly 
to promote cultural boycotts of apartheid South Africa. In 1979, she was appointed as ANC's chief representative in Scandinavia and was sent to Sweden to fulfill those responsibilities. She quickly proceeded to open offices in Denmark, Norway, and Finland. The ANC's presence in Scandinavia became a significant source of solidarity and political and moral support for the ANC and a crucial pillar in the international movement against apartheid. It was here that Ambassador Mabuza's career as a diplomat began to take shape. Long before she was bestowed with the formal title of ambassador, she served as a crucial liaison between the black masses in South Africa and people of Sweden through the government. She is widely recognized for having consolidated and cemented the work of her predecessors. It was during her time in Sweden that she mobilized Swedish schools, unions, NGOs, and civil society groups to raise funds for the establishment of the ANC school in Tanzania, the Solomon Mahlangu Freedom College, which became the educational base of many exiled children who had fled South Africa. After Sweden, Ambassador Mabuza was assigned to the United States of America. Here, she picked up her old networks and developed new ones. She reached out to artists like Quincy Jones, Alfred Woodard, Danny Glover, and Harry Belafonte. She also forged deep relationships with senior African-American lead, African leaders like Reverend Jesse Jackson, Randall Robinson, Representative Maxine Waters, Representative Barbara Lee, and famed litigator Johnny Cochran, and many others. These political and cultural icons became a crucial part of the ANC strategy for challenging apartheid using hearts and minds in the 1980s. She was at her most artistically creative during this period, penning numerous poems and publishing widely. Her publications from that period include Malibongwe, One Never Knows, From ANC to Sweden, Letter to Letter, and Africa to Me. When Nelson Mandela was released in 1990, Ambassador Mabuza was central to organizing his first trip to the US, setting up media interviews and brokering meetings with key leaders. When the ANC won elections in 1994, Ambassador Mabuza went to parliament for a brief period before being assigned to represent South Africa as head of mission at our embassies in Germany, Malaysia, the Philippines, and finally, the UK. She served each of these with passion and distinction, promoting South Africa as an investment and tourism destination and showcasing our country's remarkable artists and designers. After retiring, she remained active in the church, returning to her foundational years of Catholicism. She also continued to write and publish, and her children's books, poetry collections, and extensive archive are a testament to her rich intellectual life. After the end of apartheid, she published Tambo Lenyoka, which is a poetic celebration of her mentors, Oa Tambo and Tabombeki. Conversations with Oa Tambo and her children's book, South African Animals. Before her passing, she was close to completing her autobiography and was working on a new book about Sweden. She received many honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 2003, the National Order of Gikamanga, one of South Africa's highest decorations in 2004, and the Lifetime Achievement Award for Arts Advocacy in 2017 by the Arts and Culture Trust of South Africa. By far, one of her greatest moments was in 2019, when she was decorated with the Royal Order of the Polar Star with the rank of Commander, bestowed upon her by King Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden for the significant role she played as chief representative of the ANC whilst in Sweden from 1979 to 1986 in raising awareness among the Swedes about the injustice of apartheid and garnering support for the struggle. She passed away peacefully on the 6th of December at the age of 87 in Pretoria, surrounded by loved ones. Ambassador Mabuza is survived by her beloved daughter, Tembelise, her grandchildren, Sifiso and Tutukile, her sisters-in-law and lifelong friends, Angela, Zandi, and Unica, and scores of nieces, nephews, and grandchildren, and her sister of the heart, Barbara Masagela. She will be remembered for her generosity in providing opportunities to scores of young people, her fearlessness in the face of injustice, and her capacity 
to claim her space among all people, amongst people of all walks of life. She taught us how to walk with our heads held high. Lala ngotolo, mzilagata, pangazita, mube, malandelilang, wena wasebutlen, unga obunga ngakazi. Thank you. Lindiwe so Mabuza given a special provincial official funeral here in Gauteng. I guess accomplished is an understatement when you talk about Ambassador Mabuza. When you listen to that obituary, she received many honours, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh uh, in Scotland in 2003. The cover of this particular orchestra. And today they have offered the gift of music to Ambassador Lindwe Mabuza as a farewell gift. The family is truly grateful. We'd also like to thank Regina Mundi Youth Choir for the beautiful renditions of music enjoyed throughout the Requiem Mass. And of course, what can we say about our beautiful soloist who regaled us with beautiful, beautiful uh, soprano notes that Aunt Lindy definitely heard. We'd want to thank the clergy, the parish priest of Regina Mundi, especially Father Ndumiso Gianni, the parish priest of Regina Mundi, and, Doc and Father Lawrence Ndudusi Nilovu for having led us remarkably during the service. They will now be coming down, Father Gianni and Father Ndlovu, to finish the last part, the commendation, and we will be handing over now to the ch chaplain of the Gauteng of the South African Police Services. The chaplain of the South African Police Services is Reverend T.J. Lempe. And once the commendation is over, he will take over and make a special proclamation of the, provincial, of the special provincial official funeral service for Ambassador Lindiwe Mabuza. I now invite our clergy to um, return to the last, the last part of commendation of the service. Thank you. Let us all stand for the final commendation. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave into a Mabuza. May our farewell express our affection for her. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day, we shall joyfully greet her again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Saints 
of God come to her aid. Hasten to meet her, angels of the Lord. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May the angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord. Let perpetual light shine upon her. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our mother, Lidwe Mabuza, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed upon Lidwe Mabuza in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and your fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we meet in Christ and are with you and our mother forever. Amen. Now hand over to the chapel. Thank you very much, Director, the bereaved family, senior government officials, former President Tabombeki, former First Lady, Mrs. Mbeki, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the State President of the Republic of South Africa, the Honorable President Cyril Ramaphosa, approved that the funeral of Ambassador Lindwe Mabusa be special provincial official funeral. This funeral shall fully comply with the regulations 11B sub regulations 8 of COVID-19 lockdown regulations issued by the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs COCTA government notice number R398 of 25 March 2020. I am now going to call upon members from the poll bearers to come and drop this coffin with the national flag. Immediately after them, we'll be calling the MEC Noman Tungomo Ralehoku to come and do eology.
MEC Nomandu Nkomo Ralehoko. Thank you, Reverend Mbe. Let me greet program directors, Slindiwe, Sangwe Nisidodo, Zengisiwe Msimang, our former president, Babutabu Mbeki, the Mabuza family, let me greet Mamu Zanele Mbeki, our former deputy president, Mamu Pumzile Mnuka, Reverend R.J. T. Lembe, African National Congress that is led by our Treasurer General Babu Paul Mashatile and all the NEC members that are with him, ministers that are present today and deputy ministers, ANC veterans that are present today at this funeral, Kamama, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Early this week, the African National Congress family gathered under a somber mood to pay its last respect for the maternal remains of Comrade Ibrahim Ishmael Ibrahim, a gentle revolutionary who made immense contribution to the freedom struggle, epitomizing the very notion of selflessness throughout his life. Sadly, again today, we are gathering here as the African National Congress a few days later to bid a farewell to yet another colossus of our freedom struggle, Umam Lindwe Mabuza a woman of many parts with singular impact on the course of the liberation struggle and the building of a democratic South Africa. Mam Lindwe also personalized self-sacrifice as evidenced by a right determination to ensure that South Africa freed from all clutches of racial oppression, economic exploitation, and gender inequalities. The Gauteng province welcomes Mam Lindwe with open arms and wishes her soul to rest in everlasting resting place. During a lifetime, she has outdone herself in the service to humanity. Our deepest condolences to the Mabuza family during this difficult time in your lives. Many elders within our movement will surely agree that this loss will be as accurate felt within the movement. Those within the ANC who have spent the better part of their adult lives with her during the cut and trust of her life of the, of, in exile will touch on the memories of this intellectual force that died in the wolf revolutionary and the very diplomatic model. It is hard to imagine how her big shoes will be filled for Mam Lindiwe with a legend in a classical sense of, of word. I would argue that it is symbolically befitting to hold her, her funeral at Regina Mondi, which I believe translates Queen of the World. For literary comrade Lindwe's life was narrative of African queen that bestrides the globe, driven the deeper it ideas to help restore stolen humanity of people. Not only did he, he save the humanity, he was bearing in her diplomatic engagements she also did so in a breath of vision of expressed expression in her literal record. In both historical phases of South African history, the anti-apartheid struggle and building a post-apartheid society, she was hard act to follow in the manful spaces that she occupied. She gave all to herself to the vision of a free South Africa to, to, to transcend the rhythm of her individual life that respond to and steep with the overreaching need. We never forget that throughout her life, Mam Lindwe was a disciplined member of the ANC whose form and content was formed by, the, by its agencies. Therefore, all these remarkable facts that she performed within the context of guided by her political home, which is the African National Congress of Tata O.R. Tambo. She was commendably, sacrifice, she commendably sacrifices to the struggle where she anchored on a framework that was underpinned by the strategic goal of the rebellion movement. The goal of building a united, a democratic, and non-racial and non-sexist society. All over the world, she has been throughout this grueling but inspiring life, both a revolutionary and a diplomat, 
And she was powered by this vision of history that is encapsulated in these foundations and tenets of our struggle. Even when we start losing such humanities of the struggle, as, such as Mamlindiwe, our cold comfort stems from the frame of reference that constituted her life. This protein life opened our eyes in the amplitude of human possibilities. The South Amer American revolutionary writer U Gabriel Garcia Marquez once said that, I'll open quote, human beings are not born once and for all on the day that their mothers gave birth to them, but their life obliges them to give birth to themselves. One starts to wonder whether most of us whose generation is meant to take up their cages is in pursuit of defining the vision which a giant such as Mamlindwe has dedicated a life will be able to measure up to these imperatives of our historical moment as she did. Even before she began to play her part within the ANC, Comrade Lindwe had already shown remarkable initiatives and immovable motives side by her personality. She had dared to cross the border of her own initiative to study in Lesotho, where she obtained a university degree. She proceeded to teach in Swaziland, specializing in languages, in area constituting one of her four. Not happy with her achievements, she proceeded to study again in the United States of America. It is simply clear that even at an early stage in her life, she has on an international heart. She was internationalist before she was even developed a sophisticated, uh, sophisticated account of internationalism as framed by struggle literature. This is in itself was a remarkable fact that she seemed to have paid her, her use in, in, a, in an admonition of the American civil rights leader, such as Martin Luther King. And I want to quote you when we say that our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation, and this means that we must develop our world perspective. This intellectual disposition of internationalism would define the rest of her political biography and stand her in good stand when chips were, da were, when chips were down. Rather. By the time she was recruited in the ranks of the ANC, she was already a rough diamond in terms of her feel for the international landscape. Furthermore, her love for education had equipped her with necessary intellectual necessities to appreciate the intersectional function of oppression, including race, gender, and varied forms of imperial diminution. Our understanding of Mamlindwe is deeply sharpened where we will consider the barriers she had overcome from her childhood. The fact that she was the only one from her family who managed to acquire higher education speaks for herself immediately and resolute character what she was, what she was. Even more remarkable is the fact that she was a girl growing up in a patriarchal cultural era where biographies of women were predetermined by the fact that she, she is a woman through cultural legitimacy. That she translated into an intrinsic limitations of a moment to define a social identity. That leads us in, an, in a way, in a window, into a vital of a character. Circumventing these issues that, and the assumptions of her historical conditions, the gendered escape, uh, landscape, even without theoretical self-reflection, not only highlighted her potential as a revolutionary, but prefigured her future gender activism which would enrich the intellectual imagination of the ANC in so many ways. Indeed, reflecting to such an, a, a life of a leader is one of those big things that some of us can't, because Mamlindwe contributed to the course of our history and could, have sent, could have even sent beyond the measure of some of the things that she has done. She was a Renaissance figure whose multiple talents enabled her to be at ease under varied historical circumstances, and her intellectual amplified enabled her to develop a sophisticated conception of the struggle. In this regard, she was cultivated with red diplomatic finance, opening the many doors to and rendering the South African struggle a narrative intelligent across European uh, nations. Comrade O.R., in his, in his report, 
she indicated that in his speech give, that was given to the ANC section, women's section in 1981 in Angola, that Comrade Lindwe cried, sobbed, and ultimately collapsed on, it, on top of herself when she learned that she had been appointed as an ANC representative in the Scandinavian countries. But looking at the record of Mama, could any man have done better? Indeed, there is no better accolade one could get for one's, for one's role in the apartheid struggle during the exile days that one given by the OR himself. Comrade Lindwell's calling as a natural dip diplomat saw her posted to Europe and North America again in post-apartheid era, where her unmatched diplomat experience and considerable knowledge of, polit of, of ge geopolitics became instrumental in defining democratic South African niche in the world of nations. It would be a huge uh, disservice in many memory to reflect on the well-lived of life of Mam Lindwe and not touch on her intellectual practice as an artist. This is fact of her life as one of the distinct features which colored her revolutionary politics the same way it was colored by, the, by her politics. Consciously, her artist sensibly lent to the notion of social realism. While her poet was a thing of, of beauty in its own right, it also anchored the historical forces which shaped her social being. Therefore, her artistic production as a poem was located to the realistic of her moment. At the core, which we were twin, pro, twin problematics of race and gender as an element of a contemporary social political agenda, she herself once said, I'll open quote, poet is part of the struggle. You use the arm struggle to use political agitation methods. You recite a poem, it's better than three hour speech. It gets to the heart of matter, it moves people. In addition, poet was a weapon in the act of conscientizing both men and women about the politics of gender. Her poetry aroused consciousness about the centrality of gender problematic, not as just an agent to the revolutionary struggle itself, but attribute to the core of the struggle. This way, she combined the aesthetic and praxis in a dynamic fashion to amplify the core commitments of the struggle, so that beyond racial oppression, there could still be an area to make a legitimate claim for gender equity. Program, director, program directors, this many sides of Mamlindwe has enriched our political experience and made a mark on our history. It is therefore a, with a very heavy heart that one has to pay this triple to Umama for the very thought of not befitting from her sodomic wisdom, all in fact of our political existence in, and in depression. We are pleased though that a Colossus like her once worked with this earth with us, we will forever cherish her memories and fondness. We thank God for her, and once again, Siti Akutlanga Lungeshanga, Siabulela, Nila Lengoto, Loku Femeli, Mbos. Thank you very much, MEC. The marshalling officer will be Warrant Officer Mbele. As I call upon marshalling officer and the poll bearers to come and take their positions, we will be slow marching from this point until outside. And then we'll take a slow march outside for 50 meters and then we'll take a quick march for another 50 meters. The pallbearers can come forward with the marshalling officer to take their positions.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to proceed to the cemetery, our cemetery, because I'm going to call the pearl bearers to come and pick up the coffee so that we leave uh, the effect. We are going to Avalon Cemetery.